Morning, everyone. So you can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Yes, sir. Okay, nice. Just my screen a little bit. Yeah, so by the way, um, I changed the deadline for the weekly homeworks to be on Wednesday, so Wednesday morning, because I realized that, um, yeah, so you guys probably need some more time to finish homework one. Um, so, so it's a lot about, uh, I mean, a lot, most of the contents are actually being taught today. So I was afraid that maybe over the weekend, you, you guys don't have enough time to finish all, the, all of the homework. So um, for the future assignments, homework assignments will also make the due date to be on Wednesdays. So you can just drop it um, off before the class. I'll collect them. And also I'll distribute the, uh, the graded ones, okay? Um, so this class, we're going to continue um, our discussion on the um, on the unit conversion, because last class in the end, probably I just went over too quickly um, on how to convert different units. So some of you came to me uh, saying that um, it was uh, not very clear. So, um, so this class, we're just going to give some examples to show how we can use these ideal gas laws to do the unit conversion. Uh, so basically, uh, if we do a quick recap, so last class in the end, we talked about the ideal gas law, right? How we can use that for the unit conversion. The ideal gas law is just PV equal to NRT. And we said that in order to make this equation work, we'll have to use the, uh, the standard units, right? And the standard units uh, that we have is P for Pascal, V for meter cubed, and N is for mole, uh, R is for 8.314 joule per mole per K. And then we have T, which is in Kelvin. So let me just allow more people to join in. Okay, so um, basically if we use this set of um, units, then we should be able to use the ideal, like ideal gas law to, to do some calculations. But before we discuss ideal gas law, we also give two examples of the air pollutants, right? Um, we said that people's perceptions about air pollutants are always changing, right? Some of them may be very good chemicals, but then we later on ban them. Uh, so examples can be uh, what? The um, CFC, right? The chlorofluorocarbons, and also the gas species, which is quite controversial right now, that's the carbon dioxide, right? So carbon dioxide is leading to the climate change, but there isn't a very good way to deal with that right now because we need to use carbon. I mean, we have to generate carbon dioxide because we have to burn these fossil fuels to support our economy, right? This is going to be a quite complicated problem. Um, so then just coming back to the uh, ideal gas law and the unit conversions. So if you remember, um, we gave the table of the NAAQS, right? So this is National Ambient Air Quality Standard, which is regulated by the EPA. So basically in the table, it um, regulated or given the, uh, give the standard of the concentrations they give the standards of the concentrations for different um, air pollutants. And those include uh, basically the six criteria air pollutants, right? We have PM, sulfur dioxide, 
or socks, let's say socks, knocks, and then um, lead, ozone, or lead, carbon monoxide, and ozone. Okay, so we also discussed that for each of the air pollutant, there are multiple standards based on the uh, averaging time. Okay, so the shorter the average time, the more the uh, the higher the concentration. All right. So can you guys see me writing something? Yeah, I think my computer was just lagging. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So as long as yeah, I'm indeed writing on the board. So uh, if you cannot see those, then uh, you can just uh, let me know. Okay. So maybe it's a connection on my side too, All right? So then uh, we also mentioned that for some of the concentrations, um, they, for example, they give the regulated amount, let's say 0.1 ppm, but also they will give the mass concentration, let's say 10 milligram per meter cubed. That's where we had to consider the unit conversion, right? So we give a few metrics to represent the concentration of air pollutants. So there can be absolute concentrations. So the absolute concentrations are basically, it's the number of moles of the species. So here I'm using A, but A can be any gas species, right? So oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur dioxide, and so on. But this is the moles of the species A divided by the total volume of the species A, right? And then another metric, that we can show the concentration of air pollutant is um, mole fractions. And that can be shown as Na divided by N, right? Where the N is the total concentration of the gas molecules or the total number of moles for the air mixture, right? And also we could have the mass concentration. So mass concentration is just the mass of A divided by the volume of the gas mixture, right? So basically uh, what the unit conversion means is we want to convert from one another or at least know how to convert from one another. And we said that well, we could use the ideal gas law to do these unit conversions, right? So for example, if I ask you, what is the for example, what is the mass concentration of the ozone when we know that the ozone um, mole fraction is one ppm? So what does it mean by one ppm if we convert it into milligram per meter cubed, okay? So this is going to be the question that uh, uh, we're interested in. All right. So the unit conversion, um, basically, if as long as we know how to convert from one another for these three quantities, right, we should be good. So here I'm just going to do a, a derivation again because I think last class uh, we had quite limited time and in, in the end I went pretty fast. Okay. So let's say that if we know already what is the absolute concentration, then we should be able to calculate what is what is the mass concentration. Right, because the absolute concentration, the Na here, can be written as Ma divided by the molecular weight of A, right? It's just the mass of the gas species A divided by the molecular weight, right? And then we can write out the one over V, right? That's going to be Ma divided by V multiplied by one over molecular weight of A. Right, so this is um, quite straightforward to get it converted. And then, um, then we can also try to convert from, let's say, Na divided by N to other uh, metrics, right? So Na divided by N here, we know that ideal gas law is PV equal to NRT, right? This is what we have, right? So we can write out that basically the N here is going to be 
PV divide by RT, right? So what that means is we can just plug this equation into here, right? Which is an A divided by PV multiplied by RT, right? And we're going to have an A divided by V multiplied by RT divided by P, okay? So this is going to be um, how, uh, going to be the method that we convert from let's say the mole fraction into absolute concentration, right? And since we already have this equation here, right? We know how to convert absolute concentration into mass concentration. So we can just plug this in to get MA divided by B multiplied by RT divided by P multiplied by molecular weight of A, right? So basically, if I just circle these things out, this is the uh, absolute concentration. Uh, this is the mole fraction, right? This is the absolute concentration. Uh, here we have the mass concentration. So with this relationship here, we should be able to convert from one unit to another, okay? So uh, any questions? Did I go too far here? So I think we'll have a better understanding of this with some uh, examples, okay? So here I have an example. I think this is also uh, probably one of your homework problem uh, for the assignment one, okay? So what this problem wants us to do is to convert uh, 1100 milligram per cubic meter of, uh, cubic meter of uh, carbon dioxide into the, min, uh, into the units of PPM. Okay, so here you see what we already have. We have the mass concentration, right? We know that the mass concentration is represented as MA divided by V, right? And it's asking us, what is the mole fraction? Okay, so because we discussed <clears throat> the mole fractions generally have the units of PPM, PPB, or PPT, right? So it's asking us, what does this mean? What does this uh, what this uh, mass concentration means in terms of mole fractions, okay? So basically to convert this term into this term, right? So we have the equation listed here already, okay? So we know that Na is equal to what? It's equal to Ma divided by V multiplied by Rt divided by P multiplied by molecular weight of A, okay? So we can directly use this equation to calculate what is the um, mole fraction for the carbon dioxide. We just need to plug in all of these values we have, right? So what do we have? I'll just write out this equation here again so that we have space for plugging the values. Okay, so now we need to plug in all of these uh, numbers here. So first we know that for the mass concentration, uh, it is 1100 milligram per cubic meter, right? So we can just write it in here. Right now let's put uh, the unit as they are being introduced and then we can convert it into standard units later on, okay? So we have, uh, let me just directly write it out here. 1100 gram uh, milligrams per cubic meter, right? So we know that R is equal to 8.314, right? Joule per mole. Per K. So T here is the temperature, right? So this um, problem already stated us that the temperature is 25 Celsius, right? So we also mentioned that for the ideal gas law, in order to let it work, we have to plug in the uh, standard units, right? The standard units for the temperature is going to be in Kelvin, 
right? So we have to plug in the temperature in Kelvin, that is 273.15 plus 25 Kelvin, right? So this is RT and P here is just the pressure. So the pressure here is one atmosphere. So we we'll also need to use the standard units, right? So that's going to 1.01 .01 multiplied by 10 to the fifth of Pascal. Okay, one atmosphere is equal to 1.01 .01 multiplied by 10 to the fifth of, of uh, Pascal. And finally, it's molecular weight, okay? So what is the molecular weight of carbon dioxide? If we just remember what is the uh, atomic weight of the carbon and oxygen, we can calculate that the molecular weight is equal to 12 plus two multiplied by 16, right? 12 is uh, that the atomic weight of carbon and 16 is the weight of oxygen, right? So we're going to have 12 plus 32, that is 44 gram per mole. Okay, so we can just plug in this value here. Okay, so this is how we substitute all of these uh, parameters by its values. And you can see that right now, the units are quite in a mess, right? So we have, let's say milligram, we have gram, and although everything else are standard units, but we still need to, uh, let's say, do a sanity check to see if they can cancel out, right? Um, so if you have all of these values, the first thing is to convert it into standard units, okay? Let's say converting to standard units, right? So we have 1100, and then we need to first convert milligram into kilogram because the standard unit for mass is kilograms, right? So we know that one, let's write it out here. So one kilogram is equal to 1000 grams, okay? And that is further equal to 1000 multiply by 1,000 milligram, right? One gram is equal to 1,000 milligrams. So that's basically 10 to the six of milligrams. But here we want to convert milligram into kilograms, right? So that's going to be 1,100 multiplied by 10 to the negative six, right? Kilograms per meter cubed. Okay, so this is first converting the mass into standard units, okay? And then we have 8.314 joule per mole, okay? And then multiply by 298.15, okay? And in the denominator, <clears throat> we have 1.01, um, multiply by 10 to the fifth of Pascal, and then 44, okay? So here, it's another, uh, it's another unit conversion because we need to convert the grams into kilograms, okay? So this is going to be 44 multiplied by 10 to the negative three kilogram per mole. Okay, so this is everything, all right? So if you're following me, uh, writing these steps out, then we can do a sanity check to just ensure that the units are correct, okay? So we can just cancel a few things out. Um, for example, the Kelvin can cancel out, right? And then uh, you have the kilogram, kilogram will cancel out. And then also the mole here, will cancel out, right? So eventually, if you just look at the unit here, so this is just going to be joule per Pascal per meter cubed, right? So how does that cancel out, right? So the Pascal, we know that Pascal multiplied by a meter squared, that's a Newton. 
right? So it's a pressure multiplied by a uh, specific area, right? Surface area, that's force. And then force multiplied by meter, that's joule. So basically these two things can cancel out as well. These two units can cancel out. So basically the entire thing, the entire equation is unitless. Okay. So it indeed makes sense, right? Because we're talking talking about the mole fractions. So the fractions should be unitless. They should not have any, carry any unit in here. Um, so then it's just a matter of using a calculator to uh, do these calculations. So let me just write out this equation again, right? 1100 multiplied by 10 to the negative six, multiplied by 8.314 to 98.15. Ten to the fifth, ten to the negative three. Okay, so this is the final equation. You can just use your calculator to find out what that is, but uh, I'll directly write out the answer. That's point zero 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 six one three six. Okay, so this is the final answer. And in your homework, I recommend you to let's say circle out this numerical answer for me to better locate where the answer is. Okay, so now this is actually still not the uh, not the final answer yet because we want to show the values in ppm, right? And this is the number we got. So then it's a question of um, how do we get this uh, this pp uh, this uh, uh, let me see how do we get this ppm value? So here I have a quick pool. You can try to find out what is the answer. So what is 0 0.0006136 in PPM? So we'll give it 10 more seconds. Okay, we'll stop here. And I'll share the results. Okay, so we mentioned that, <clears throat> so first about the results, most of you guys are correct. That's 613.6 PPM, okay? So uh, basically what we got out of this answer is the mole fraction, right? So it is the number of molecules or number of moles for this carbon dioxide in all of the um, in, in, in all, all of the gas mixture in terms of moles, right? So we know that ppm, what that means is parts per million. Okay, so one ppm basically means ten to the negative six. Okay, so you see that for the um, for the mole fraction of the carbon dioxide, actually there are 613.6 of 10 to the negative uh, six, right? So what that means is, it's just going to be 613.6 ppm, right? So one ppm, if you just uh, remember this number here, one ppm means 10 to the negative six, then what we do is, we count how many of these 10 to the negative six units are here, right? You see that this thing or this value here happened to have uh, more than 600 of these units, right? So that's why we have 613.6 of PPM, okay? So try to bear this in mind. Uh, this is going to be quite uh, helpful later on when we uh, try to convert different units. Right. So if I further ask you, what is this value in PPB? Right. So if it's in PPB, we know that one PPB 
is 10 to the negative nine, right? So the PPB value will be 613600 PPB. Okay, so this is how we convert these raw numbers into uh, the values of PPM or PPB or PPT. Okay, so this is an example um, of how we can do uh, these unit conversions from let's say mass concentration to mole fractions. Okay, so here's another example. Actually, it's a, it's a problem on your textbook. So we can probably just quickly go over it as we already know what kind of equations we could use, right? So here we're going back to the NAAQS table again, right? So first, if we just look at the question A, uh, what is the eight hour AAQS for ozone, okay? So if we first locate ozone, right? You see that ozone only happen, uh, only have the value for eight hour of uh, uh, averaging time, which is point, uh, 0 0.075 ppm, okay? So the question is asking, what is this concentration expressed in micrograms per meter cubed? All right. So uh, someone told me that the poll didn't pop up on the screen, but uh, never mind. We're just trying this for the first time. Okay, I will not uh, count the participation for the uh, for the first few classes because I know that uh, some of you might be dropping in. There may be a few joining in the classes too. So we'll start to count the participation after everything is finalized. Um, so um, let's come back to this question. Um, so this is asking us, what is the concentration of ozone expressed in mass concentrations, right? So if you consider the previous question, it is asking how to convert the mass concentration into PPM. But this problem is asking, what is the mass concentration uh, that's, uh, what is the uh, PPM? What does the PPM means in terms of mass concentrations, right? So we just need to, still need to use this equation, but use it, in another way, right? You originally it was in this way, now we just use that in this way, right? So if we just rewrite this equation, we have MA divided by V equal to NA divided by N multiplied by P molecular weight of A divided by RT, okay? So this is how we can convert, it's originally is converting mole fraction into mass concentration. Now we're basically using it reversely, right? We're converting mass concentrations into uh, mole fractions. And this is going to be the equation that uh, we can use for this problem. Because uh, if you look at this equation, we already have the mole fraction of the ozone, right? It's 0 0.075 ppm, right? And we know what is the pressure, uh, ambient pressure, RT, and molecular weight of the ozone. So we just need to plug in all of these values again and try to make sure that we use the standard units, right? So I'll just plug in these values, right? You have 0 0.075 ppm. So we directly convert ppm into the, um, this, let's say the standard units, which means that it's going to be uh, 10 to the negative six. Right, and then for this ratio here, the pressure is 1.01 .01 multiplied by 10 to the fifth Pascal. And then the molecular weight for the ozone, let's say we do a calculation that's 16 multiplied by three, right? So uh, that's actually 48 gram per mole, right? And to directly use the standard units, we're going to have 48 multiplied by 10 to the negative three, three kilogram per mole. And in the denominator, we have 8.314 joule per mole per K. And then the temperature, we assume that it's a ambient temperature, 25 Celsius again. So that's 298.15. Kelvin. Okay. So right now we have everything in standard units, right? And 
if you pull out your calculator and plug all of these values in, so you will find out that uh, the final answer is 1.47 multiplied by 10 to the negative seven kilogram per meter cubed. Okay, so this is the mass concentration, but further, if you pay attention here, uh, they're asking for uh, basically micrograms per meter cubed, right? So we need to convert kilograms into micrograms. So how does that work? We know that one kilogram is equal to 10 to the third of grams, right? And to convert grams into micrograms, that's another 10 to the six uh, micrograms, okay? So in total, that's going to be 10 to the ninth of micrograms, right? We just need to convert this, basically, uh, instead of using kilograms, we use 10 to the ninth of micrograms. So if you plug that in, that is going to be 1.47 multiplied by negative seven and multiplied by 10 to the uh, ninth microgram per meter cubed. So that's going to be 147 microgram per meter cubed. Okay, so this is the way we convert ozone concentration from the uh, mole fraction into mass concentrations. All right, so we got this solved. So the second question is asking, what is the 24 hour AAQS for sulfur dioxide expressed, also expressed in um, micrograms per meter cubed, right? So if you look at sulfur dioxide, right? And then it's asking for 24 hour, which is basically 0.14 ppm. Right, so it's asking us to convert this ppm value into uh, microgram per meter cube again. Okay, so we can basically use the same equation. So still the same old equation, right? Instead, uh, we have to use some new values for the mole fraction, the molecular weight, right? Just these two numbers. Okay, so. Um, I'll just write out this uh, equation again with the new values, right, to just quickly go over it. So 0.14 ppm, if you convert it into standard units, that's 10 to the negative six, okay? And then you uh, multiply this ratio here, that's 1.01 multiplied by 10 to the fifth Pascal. And then for the molecular weight, if you have sulfur dioxide, that's basically 32 plus two multiplied by 16, which is 64 gram per mole, All right? But here you will need to plug in the uh, standard units, right? The molecular weight in standard units, that's going to be 10 to the negative three kilogram per mole. And then the denominator you have 8.314, Joule per mole per K. And then the temperature, 298.15 Kelvin. Okay, so I directly give you the answer here uh, so that you can just compare the, the values. Um, so we have 365 microgram per meter cubed. Okay, so, <clears throat> Basically, we can use these equations to convert the units from one to the other. And uh, I have to stress this because later on uh, in the class and also in your team project, you have to do these conversions quite a lot. Okay, so this is the question B. So look, let's look at the question three. Um, so let's assume that a sample of air at 25 Celsius and contain the sulfur dioxide concentration at a concentration that's equal to the NAAQS standard, okay? And this air is raised and the temperature is raised to 150 Celsius, okay? So what this problem is describing is that um, basically we have a chamber of air. Let's say we have a balloon of air. Okay. 
we have a balloon of air that contains sulfur dioxide inside. <clears throat> and then the sulfur dioxide has the concentration that's equal to this um, equal to this NAQS standard, 0.15 ppm, okay? And then what happens is that for this balloon of air, originally it's under a temperature of 25 Celsius. And then we decided to heat it up to 150 Celsius. So what's going to happen? You know that according to ideal gas law, if temperature is raised, then under the same pressure, the volume is going to expand, right? So instead of this smaller balloon, we're going to have much larger balloon. But still, we have sulfur dioxide inside. Okay, so now it's asking us what is the sulfur dioxide concentration at this newer temperature in both ppm and in microgram per meter cubed. Okay, so um, I think to answer this question, we need to. Let's say, I think by using the example of the balloon, that can really help us to understand this, right? So the balloon is sealed throughout this entire heating period, right? So when we discuss what is the mole fraction, basically that's the number of moles for carbon, uh, for the sulfur dioxide divided by the number of moles for the total air mixture molecules. So by just heating it up, these two numbers have not changed at all, right? Because they're still sealed within this balloon, right? So if we ask you what is the, uh, uh, what is the sulfur dioxide concentration in PPM, then it's still going to be the same, right? That's still 0.14 PPM. Simply because there's no air being leaked outside, right? In this larger balloon, the sulfur dioxide concentration is still the same. Or the, basically the total moles of the sulfur dioxide is the same. And also the total moles of the, uh, of the air mixture is the same, right? And then if we know what is the mass, oh, if we know what is the mole fraction under this new temperature, then we can use this equation again to convert the, uh, basically the mole fraction into mass concentration again, right? Because right now we're looking at what is the concentration in micrograms per meter cubed. It's asking for this value here. We know what is the, what is the uh, mole fraction, right? So the pressure is the same, the molecular weight is the same, the R is the same, it's only the temperature that changed. So instead of using 25 Celsius, we start to use 150 Celsius, right? And of course, we plug in the temperature, we need to pay attention that we're using 150 plus 273.15 in Kelvin, okay? So by just plugging in this new temperature here, we can calculate what is the mass concentration, right? Um, so this is the example in your textbook. And uh, if you have time, you can also go over it uh, after our class, right? So to just look at how the textbook tries to solve this problem. Okay. Um, yeah, so as I said in here, uh, let's think about this heating uh, process again. So if the air sample is heated up to 150 Celsius while maintaining the same pressure, so how will the mole fraction change? It's going to be unchanged, right? So if you think about this um, balloon case again, right? So at lower temperature, we're going to have a smaller volume, right? When the sulfur dioxide is getting um, mixed within the entire air mixture. But at higher temperature, the volume of the balloon is going to increase, but the exact number of moles of the sulfur dioxide and the air mixture is still the same, right? So that's why the temperature is not going to change the mole fraction at all, but it is going to change the, uh, the mass concentration because mass concentration expressed in MA divided by V here, right? So the MA is not changed, but the V becomes larger. That's why the mass concentration will, will, uh, will get changed, right? So any questions? I think this, Plus, a lot of the discussions are about uh, are about the calculations, and uh, I was a little bit afraid that maybe I went too fast. Yeah, you can either just speak up or 
type in the chat. Okay. It's like I, I feel pretty comfortable. I, I guess I've done a lot of conversions over my my lifetime as a just in this major or whatever. So I feel pretty mm -hmm. comfortable with stuff. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that's nice to hear. Um, yeah, so basically from your homework, you're also going to get some um, practice, okay? And uh, as I said, if you have any questions or if you're not clear on anything, we have multiple office hours. And more specifically, on Tuesday night, uh, I'm going to stay in the same classroom. Um, so you can just come over to me. I'll stay there for one hour. <clears throat> we can use the Blackboard to do some derivations too. I guess for that uh, office hour, that's going to be more useful later on when we get to the team projects because uh, the workload can get quite uh, uh, quite heavy when 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 you uh, assemble the team and distribute the work work of that together. Okay. Um. Yeah. So there's one last thing about the uh, introduction section for the for the class which is a general overview of the coal-fired power plant. And um, actually in your team project, you're going to design a air pollution um, control device for a actual coal-fired power plant, okay? <clears throat> so what this um, uh, question is asking for is, let's say that if the coal that we use has a 2.25% of sulfur content, okay? It also gives you the heating value. And we're trying to design a, or trying to build up, let's say a power plant that has a capacity of 400 megawatt, okay? So, uh, and at the same time, we know that the power plant is going to burn this coal, but the burning process is not very efficient. We're not extracting all of the energy out, okay? So that's why it involves an efficiency. So this coal is being burnt at an efficiency of 40%. And the total capacity of the power plant is 400 megawatt. So with these conditions, it wants us to estimate what is the rate of the sulfur dioxide emission, okay? So first, uh, I'm going to circle out these parameters or these values here. So we can get very confused just by looking at these, looking at these uh, numbers. I know that uh, uh, if we don't have much background on these uh, you know, power systems, we can get really, really get, uh, get lost among these numbers here, okay? So first, to help you understand what these uh, power plant means and what these numbers mean, uh, I'm just going to talk about this um, capacity here. So what capacity means is how much electricity this power plant can give you, okay? So for example, the, you see that the unit here is megawatt. So basically it means that for each second, right? So for each second, one second, there's going to be 400 megajoules of the energy being generated or uh, this energy is specifically for electricity energy, right? Electrical energy being generated from this power plant. So then you may have, uh, have the question, well, how does this, what does this uh, 400 megawatt mean? Right? Is that a lot or is that very small? So here I have a link that is a list of the largest power stations in the United States. So this is directly from Wikipedia. And uh, here I'm listing a few, uh, basically top six of the power plants, okay? So I think for the top two, uh, they're not for coal fire or they're not for the uh, fossil fuel combustion. For example, the first one, uh, this is actually a hydro, uh, uh, hydro plant, okay? So instead of using combustion, it's using the energy of the water, right? The second one is using nuclear, right? This is in Arizona. And later on, you see that for, from the third one to the sixth one, they're all using fossil fuel, okay? Using either using natural gas or coal or completely coal, okay? So further, if you look at the capacity, right? The capacity is generally shown in megawatts. Right, so it shows how much of electrical energy this plant can generate. And you see that for the top six, uh, generally give you more than 3000 megawatts, which is quite a lot. For this problem that we have, this is 400 megawatt. We can treat that as a smaller power plant. Okay, so this is what the capacity means. So as I said, 
for a coal-fired power plant, it uses combustion to generate the heat and then further use the heat to generate or to basically move the turbine. Let, let me write that out, okay? So I'm just trying to draw a schematic diagram of the coal-fired power plant. So normally this is how the combustor looks like, right? So below here we have either coal particles being introduced inside or the natural gas being introduced inside. And then we have a lot of flames that generate the heat. By the top of the combustor, there are a lot of water pipes uh, where the water is being converted into uh, high temperature steams. And these steams can further get uh, transported to drive the turbines, right? the turbine moves, and then you can generate electricity, right? But at the same time, when we burn these coal, par these coal particles, we also generate a lot of the toxic gases, for example, sulfur dioxide or particulate matter. So what happens is that, is that this flue gas, what we call flue gas, is going to get treated by uh, multiple devices, right? We can have the electrostatic precipitator or the, the scrubber, and then eventually go to a very tall stack, okay? So this is how generally a coal-fired power plant works. But here, we're just trying to focus on uh, what is the basic emission of the sulfur dioxide out of the coal-fired power plant, okay? So then um, basically, if you know what is electricity being generated, and then you know that how much energy we need to, to, to generate the heat and then convert into electricity, right? So here I'm simp uh, basically trying to simplify this uh, question into this problem here. So let's say if the power plant has a capacity of 400 megawatt, okay? And it has an efficiency of 40%. So uh, I will ask you, what is the actual power that's being generated from coal combustion, right? So this is our second quiz question. So let's do a simple test. Okay, 10 more seconds, because um, I think I might need to explain this in a little bit more, there's a little bit more time. All right, we'll stop here for now, because I saw that actually most of us did not choose the correct answer, okay? So as I said, when we talk about capacity, okay? When we talk about capacity, this is specifically talking about the electricity. Okay, this is electricity power. So we know that electricity is generated by burning coal. And there's an efficiency of 40% because not all of the heat is being used to generate the electricity, right? There's always some loss of the, uh, this combustion process. So what that means is that if we generate, let's say 40 joules of the electricity, let's say not 40 joules, 40 watt, uh, for you, let's see. Well, if we generate uh, 40 watt of the electricity, then what that means is that we need to burn 100 watt of the coal to provide us the heat, right? So this is what the efficiency means because when we burn these fossil fuels, not all of the energy are, are converted into electricity, right? So we need to divide this capacity by the efficiency number to get the actual power that's being generated from the coal combustion, all right? So if I just uh, post the quiz again, and try to make sure that all of you understand this. Um, let's see. All right, oh, well, I cannot, uh, well, it seems that I cannot uh, set this up again. I'll relaunch.
Okay. Okay, 10 more seconds. All right, so most of you got the correct answer. That's 1,000 megawatt. Okay, so as I said, um, so the combustion of the coal is not a complete or is not a very efficient process. So what that means is that in order to generate this amount of electricity, we have to burn more coal, right? So that's why we would divide 400 megawatt by 40% which is giving us 1000 megawatt, okay? And then we can um, just look at this equation here to uh, look at this problem here to calculate how much coal we are going to burn and how much uh, sulfur dioxide we're going to release. So I don't think we have uh, enough time to go over this. So we'll talk about this problem next Monday, okay? So next Monday, we're going to meet in the classroom and we can do some more derivations on this aspect. All right, so thank you all for joining me and let me know if you have any questions, okay? Bye guys. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend, Professor. Bye.